All right, great. All right, well, thank you everybody for being here. My name is Ashley Marco. Uh, today is October 23rd, 5.05 p.m. Central Standard Time. If you are on another time, thank you so much. Uh, I know it's Friday, so I really appreciate your time for being here. Um, and just so you know, you're aware, this is going to be about 35 to 45 minutes. Um, I will be stopping for questions as I go through the topics. Um, this one won't be necessarily as long as my previous videos, just because this is um, not going to be too heavy on, you know, LinkedIn and resumes and things like that. This is going to be post-COVID, um, you know, how to prepare and things like that. And we'll get into that as we go. Uh, but as I said, my name is Ashley Margo. Thank you so much for being here. Um, just to get a little insight to me, for those of you who probably haven't seen any previous videos that I've done with Dan, for the CRC or CRA Academy. Um, I am a remote site monitor level two with a global CRO, um, a very a great CRO. So uh, I've been very fortunate with the experience that I've had to have this year, uh, especially during this time of COVID. So um, I'm just happy to be here and bring some of the knowledge that I've gained over the past year and a half, two years, and also how I've been able to help other people. And so I'm hoping that you find this webinar you know, helpful and useful. And as I go through, you know, again, I'll stop for questions. So, you know, please feel free to either write it down in the chat or just wait. And when I stop, I'll make sure to answer as much as I can. Um, outside of my position as a remote side monitor too, I also have, uh, as some of you might already know, uh, I have my own little, I could say, you know, side business. I call it the AM approach. Um, pretty much here is I assist my clientele in what I call the application process enhancement, which is I review your resume, uh, your LinkedIn profile, and uh, all your other application documents. Now, if you don't know what that is, uh, definitely need to look into it. Um, you should definitely have way more than just one document when applying to jobs. Um, but nonetheless, uh, I also help with mock trial interviews. Uh, and so a lot of the things that I cover here today in this webinar, as well as the other previous webinars that I've done with Dan, uh, they cover a lot of um, kind of some concepts that I use while I'm going in depth with my clientele. So just, you know, to keep that in mind, um, this is very, you know, personal stuff that I share that I feel is has been very helpful for me and most definitely helpful for my clientele. So I hope you like it. Uh, to give some background, just for those that, you know, of course, you're in the CRC or CRA Academy. And, you know, for some of you all, you have clinical research background. Some of you have clinical background and even some probably have none whatsoever. And just to give you a little bit on my experience, just so that, you know, you feel comfortable as you're preparing for, you know, graduating from your certification and coming out to the clinical research industry. Um, prior to having started my RSM2 position, which just started this past June, um, I hadn't had any clinical research experience since about three or four years ago. And even at that, it wasn't really in depth. I was a medical assistant at a site, a very small site. And um, what I really did was just more oper clinical operational where I assisted in um, helping out, you know, tr uh, vitalize patients and sometimes with the clinical operation paperwork. Um, but nothing very in depth with clinical regulation, the clinical research as far as like reviewing or editing or doing any sort of thing with like adverse events and things like that. So um, definitely not enough to say that I was super strong in clinical research, just more of a strong clinical background. And um, when I decided I wanted to get back into clinical research, I looked up Dan and um, once I got his book, I read it, I understood everything that he was saying. I looked up his videos and I was instantly just very focused and moving forward with making sure that I got back into the industry. And so for a whole month straight, I heavily focused on my approach, a very tactful, very strategic approach, which I'll be giving you some, some insight today on what I would do. And, um, you know, I was able to, within a month, get about seven interviews for major positions and um, just continue to kind of snowball from there until eventually I got the position I wanted with the CRO that I wanted. And, um, you know, I'm also going to give you some tactics on that, how to kind of hone in specifically in the site or CRO that you're hoping to work for. So 
Oh, so sorry. Somebody's saying they can't hear anything. I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay. I can hear you. One person can hear me. Okay. All right. So, um, so sorry, uh, Irina. And also apologize. I'm not pronouncing your name right, but you might want to check uh, your audio function then. Um, so if not, either way, this is recorded. So hopefully, um, if for whatever reason you're not able to fix that, then you can listen to the recording back once Dan and or Monica post it up. But okay, moving forward. And um, so bringing that up is because why I brought that up as far as my background is because um, right now, especially with a lot of my clientele and some of them have actually came from uh, Dan's um, CRC and CRA Academy. Um, you know, you get really nervous, especially for those who have hardly any background to no background. Um, and, you know, I'm here to let you know that you can be at ease at that. Really, that doesn't matter as much. You are here to get your certification and you are getting your certification right now. So that's that in itself is going to help you a ton. What really matters the most is what you're doing right now, especially in this crucial time. You know, we're during COVID-19, whether we're coming into another lockdown or not coming into another lockdown opening up, whatever it is for your state. Um, this is very crucial because sites all over, as well as CROs, are hiring like crazy. It's it's the boom of clinical research. And I know you've heard Dan say that plenty of times on his videos, and I'm sure as well as in his teachings. And it's very true. Um, my CRO recently just, uh, I believe, brought on about 300 and some uh, remote site monitors within, a, I think, a month to two month process. So like, in, and they're not stopping either. So um it's definitely a really great time to be in your shoes. And um, I'm very happy that you're here today. So hopefully you can take a lot of this information and, and move forward with it and uh, make things work for you in the best of your, uh, your capability. And so, like I said, uh, this is not gonna be about resume or LinkedIn. Uh, I may mention some things of LinkedIn, but if you are wanting to get more on that or hoping that this is that, you can go review some of the old videos I did with Dan. Um, that is just the surface scratching of what it is that I provide my clientele. So please do that. It's very helpful, especially if you have not been doing any of any adjustments to your LinkedIn or to your resume. But okay. All right. So let's move forward. First things first, uh, online education. Uh, I know you hear Dan say this a lot as far as, you know, you know, getting out there, learning, getting certified, you know, taking some courses. This is very crucial because, yes, you know, your certification definitely gives you that stamp to say, like, okay, I understand what clinical research is. I, I get what I'm doing. I know that I can be of service to your site. But you want to be more than that because, remember, you know, for instance, say if you're just in Cali, California, excuse me, um, and you're going up against your other classmates, right, then maybe six, seven, 12 other people that are also looking for a position, you all are having that same certification. And the same thing goes for those that are in Fast Track Academy and all those other things. I mean, we all know that Dad's Academy is the best. <laughs> um, I'm biased, right? But um, still, you know, you need to shine. You need to shine bigger. And, and this is where, you know, your strategic thinking comes into play and how you want to address that. So, you know, the best thing for you to do um, is for you to make sure you get as much education as you can. So if you're just starting the academy or you're already finishing, the best thing for you to do is to look at the certifications you've already gained within the academy and look how you can broaden that out. Now, one way to do that, um, and this is kind of like a um, kill two versus one stone, is you can join organizations. And I highly recommend that. Organizations give you access to network. It gives you, you know, the name if people are actually also in the in the membership. I mean, I've actually been in a situation where somebody's acknowledged my membership, which I actually personally didn't expect that. So, you know, that kind of gives you a good plus. It makes you seem more professional and also lets you know that you're up, you're getting updates on all the new uh, information that's coming through the main organization. So one is ACRP, one is SOCRA. I'm sure you've heard that, have heard those before. Uh, each one has um, their different benefits. I do know that SOCRA offers um, with the membership four certifications that come with it with city programming. And so this is super important. Um, those are four extra certifications you can get, you can finish over the weekend. Um, super easy. And these are more basic overlying certifications that almost any organization would love for you to have. 
Um, so, you know, look into that. ACRP too, um, they do not provide any, uh, I guess, free certifications, but at least from my knowledge as of right now, but they do have really amazing uh, offers of certifications or classes within ACRP that um, are very cheap with the membership. And they go into depth. The, the amount of options are exponential. And this is key because this is how you start, you know, molding yourself as a researcher, a clinical researcher. You know, as a graduate, most people are going to want to come out and, you know, OK, I'm, I just I want a job. And that's totally understandable. But, you know, if you have time, if you have a month, two months, three months time, this is crucial for you to sit down and really think about, okay, where do I want to go? How am I going to, you know, evaluate myself? Where are my strengths? What can I hone in on? And what can I learn more of? Or what I, what do I have least skills in that are important, not just for CROs or sites, but also for this technological era that we are literally moving into. And um, hopefully all of y'all are doing BERT trial. That was uh, told by Dan. It was amazing. I actually went on there and uh, got that some quick certification. So definitely make sure you do that. But you want to think about these things. And especially if you have all this time on your hands, uh, if you are going to go, for instance, to a CRO that really hones in on, you know, um, regulatory understanding, you want to go out of your way and learn more into that. So just because you didn't get the education in it, specifically, you know, with an academy, you already can come in with this cert. So even if you do not have background, clinical research background, you have a case to be able to state, yes, okay, you know, I don't have this background, but I come with the knowledge already. I come certified and let me prove it to you. And that in itself will be the thing that differentiates you and more than possibly gets you at least a screening phone call. And I always tell my clientele that it's a screening phone call that you need. Once you get that, it's no longer your resume. It's no longer your certifications. It's you, you selling yourself. And so long as you have that skill set, I mean, not everybody has it, unfortunately, but, you know, you can prep for that. But um, it's very important that, you know, you get to that screen call. And that's really what you want to do. It's all risk management and how you, you know, present yourself on the resume by the tactics or the things that you do that you learn, etc. So one thing you'd want to do is check, okay, is the side of CRO really heavy on data management? Is the position that I'm going into, do they want a clinical researcher, clinical research coordinator that focuses on data management or solely focuses on clinical operation or um, has a very particular focus in a therapeutic area? Um, you know, sometimes you'll do generalized work, but, you know, they also have a therapeutic special specialty. So, you know, these things you want to keep in mind, you know, of course, naturally, if you if you hone in on one specific CRO or site that you want to work for, um, it definitely helps you kind of lean into that position. Um, but for whatever reason, if you don't get it right off the bat, it's completely fine. That's not the end of the world. But you gained knowledge. You gained uh, a wider fast background and and that being you know if you get um with another place you can use that as a negotiation for you know as far as your pay you know there's always positives no matter which way you look at it it's just how you maneuver right so um i would also highly suggest uh like i said with the virtual era that we're going into look into technologies you know add organizations that are being uh, that are utilizing certain technologies. So like, for instance, if a CRO is using Bird Trial, you want to go on your LinkedIn or you want to go on Google or whatever platform that you'd like to use and, you know, look up that organization that created that system and keep up to date with what they're doing. You know, this is, this is you going out of your way, out of the box, being prepared, not just for, you know, that specific site or CRO, but in general. You know, where I'm at in Austin, Texas, the whole state of Texas, in the clinical industry, almost every major hospital uses a system uh, called Cerner. So what I did is I looked up Cerner and uh, I YouTubed it, got a view for how it looked just so that, you know, when I first see it, it wouldn't intimidate me. Um, and I took some time to read up on it, get an understanding of it. You know, obviously you can't get certified in it, but if you can already have an idea like virtually how it looks and how it's laid out when you discuss that system, 
you know, you can say, oh, I don't have one on one experience with it, but I've, you know, I've seen the system. I'm more than confident I can, you know, maneuver the system and you can give examples as to other systems you use, you know, so you're kind of convincing them that although you don't have the direct experience, you'll be more than fine. And that's really what you're there to do, right? When you're doing these interviews, you want to make sure that you sell yourself as best as possible. And again, these are the different things and tactics that I teach. Um, but, you know, hopefully this is something for you to think on um, real, you know, in depth because not a lot of people do that. And I honestly feel that it's that extra that you do and go out of your way to, to strategically maneuver with that is going to make all the difference between you and the person that you're up against when it comes to a job. And ultimately, right, this is what we want. We want to not just get in the industry, but we would love very much to also put ourselves in a situation to choose, right, to have options. And um, I definitely had options. My clientele have definitely had multiple options and multiple interviews. And so I feel very strongly about this tactic. And I really hope that um, you can use this for multiple other things that you find yourself, you know, coming across. But let me go ahead and go back to the chat and see if anybody has any questions. Uh, okay, where would you find another pre-recorded session? So uh, Dan's YouTube. Um, and as far as the last one that I had here uh, on, I think it was the CRC Academy. I think I had two actually, one with the CRC and one with the CRA. Um, those I honestly don't know. You might want to ask Dan that. I'm, I'm assuming that you know you can request those, or if he has some sort of system. Um, but yes, they're they're all there. Uh, and I would definitely definitely suggest that if you like the information I have there and you find it extremely useful, and you would like to go the next step, uh, please go to my LinkedIn. Uh, go see my reviews because my reviews say it all. And um, Feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in going further. But yeah, thank you. And I hope you enjoy the videos when you find them. The question is, uh, let's say I get turned down by a CRO after an interview and they have all my information. Does that hurt my future chances with the same CRO? Like the first time impression thing. Oh, that's, that's so funny that you mentioned that. Um, I have this question all the time, but yeah. So part of, I mean, I do kind of mention this in another video, but First impressions are everything. Um, now, when it comes to your resume and your application process, you know, there are ways around that. It's it's a bit, a lot of information to go over to, maybe not so much today, but um, there's always ways to, to adjust any things that have been previously done. But again, you know, guidance is key. I mean, this is also why, you know, you're here in the CRC CRA Academy because, you know, you can do a better job when you have guidance from somebody that's gone through the process and understands the process. And, you know, how they say you stand on the shoulders of giants kind of a thing. Um, yeah, so I definitely think you'd be completely fine. Uh, it's just how you plan your application process and how you lay it out, just especially an interview. You know, interviews are everything and they do keep documentation, at least from the places that I've interviewed before, uh, and also because I, aside from my the AM approach job that I have, I've spoken with many uh, clinical research um, uh, recruiters, and they do keep documentation. Now, sometimes the recruiter is a third party entity that just, just kind of like screens you to take you to the talent acquisition specialist or the hiring manager within the CRO. Um, so that really isn't too bad, you know, but Nonetheless, you'd be totally fine. You just, of course, the next time around, you need to make sure that the impression is solid, you're clear, you're confident, and you know you also just don't have the basic responses. And like I tell people, when you're in an interview, when you're with our team, when you're with people, when you're talking, you're really telling stories to each other. You're saying about your day, the other person talks about their day, and so on and so forth. It's like story flowing. In an interview, people forget about that. You're talking to another human being, so you're not just supposed to answer questions. You're supposed to have a flowing conversation while strategically answering the question and also providing extra information that they're not asking. And so, you know, that's the real tactic and doing that is, I think, an art in itself, to be quite honest. But um, so long as you have those skill sets and, and you focus in on that, it doesn't matter, you know, if you did extremely horrible the first time around, you'll be totally fine. So hopefully that answers your question. 
Uh, so Rebecca, on a CV, where do you suggest adding the CRC Academy? Under education or experience, if you have a bachelor's already? Um, so that is actually kind of, um, so first of all, when you're applying to a job, uh, CRC or CRA position, bachelor's is almost always required. Not always, always, but almost always. And so if that is the case, um, and it is a requirement, you know, they're gonna assume that you already have the bachelor's when you are applying. So um, that point really stating that you have a bachelor's right up in the front or in the top really isn't necessary because it's kind of common knowledge that you're only gonna apply if you meet the requirements, right? So um, it doesn't necessarily hinder you where you put your bachelor's, um, but you really wanna put any certification that you have um, where anybody can see it. So middle, top, however you prefer. Uh, with my clientele, I do have a particular template that I like to follow. Um, uh, but, you know, again, it just comes down to you sh showing your strengths as best as possible on your resume. So, you know, if your certification really is everything and it's crucial, which of course it is, um, you're definitely at the top for sure. Um, so hopefully that answers your question. Um, are there any other questions? All right, great. Thank you so much for that, you guys. And let's uh, let's move forward. So the next one, um, I call it, you know, mirroring mirroring your CRO or site. Um, and so for this, it's kind of like um, I do this a lot. I've actually been doing this since I started working. Uh, I think it was like 21. I mean, I started when I was 19, but my first job, I don't count. <laughs> um, but, you know, you kind of mirror the job location of where you're wanting to go. And this is also another way that I feel is thinking outside of the box. So um, in this case, you know, if you are applying to a site that, grow that you know, specifically, you know, wants a CRA or CRC with certain skills and qualifications, um, naturally any applicant is gonna be like, okay, well, I have a bachelor's and I have a science background, life science. And okay, well, I have a CRC, CRC, CRA certification. I mean, of course they're gonna want me. Yes, but then, you know, logistically you wanna think about, okay, well, how many people am I going up against? And right now in the era that this is clinical research booming, you're going up, against thousand applicants and not just within your area. You even go again, going up against applicants that are willing to move because of how dire the situation is to get a job, you know? So, and that's just the realness of our situation right now with this economy, right? So you really want to think outside of the box and tailor yourself and more especially tailor yourself to the places that you really, really want to get into. And this is what I did. So, you know, one way you can do that, um, is going to the organization's website, right? So in this case, for my example, um, not with my current position, but uh, say when I was wanting to work for a clinic, right? Uh, I Googled the clinic's uh, website. I looked up on there what it is they were, they were about, their mission, their vision statement. I got very clear what it was obvious that they were focused on. And then, you know, I went in and I focused, and hindered, excuse me, I went in and focused and hindered the, Sorry, I went and focused on the personnel that were working there. And then, you know, I went on LinkedIn to look up that personnel and see like, okay, well, what kind of skill sets do they have? Um, how exactly, you know, do I differ from them? And what can I do right now this week? You know, because obviously I wanted to apply right away. What can I do right now this week to make things change or happen for me for this job? Um, so I would look up the personnel, I would look up the certifications on their LinkedIn, you know, I would see, you know, uh, what were their previous jobs like and the job descriptions that they had, if they had any job descriptions. Um, I, you know, went as far as looking at the description in, in the job description, the specific keywording, keywords that they were using, and if that matched with mine, and, you know, in that way, I kind of gathered as to how strong I was of an applicant. And getting all that together um, along with seeing you know any certs that I could get at that time within that week um, I kind of molded myself for that application right and um, really the key point of this is for you to understand you know 
it's not just what you have and what you bring to the table. I mean, we are in, you know, an era where information is infinite. You know, you have so many tools. Everybody has so many tools. It's how you use it and how you think about it. So if this is the career you want. And, and really, it's not just because, you know, obviously it's not just because of money and all that, right? But just saying, you know, it's not because of money and position and all of that. It's really because this is where you want to be. You need to start really looking at how you're approaching things and what it is that you're willing to do and how much time are you willing to research to make it happen for you. Um, and for me, I've literally never been... I'm just going to close this a bit, okay? Because that's very loud, okay? Um, and I've been very fortunate with that, but I also feel like it has a lot to do with the fact of how I approach uh, my job search and um, how I cater specifically, you know, to to what they're looking for and also utilizing my strengths to hone in with that, right? So um, it's a lot of self-analysis and um, kind of matching yourself to those personnel that are already working there, right? Um, so that definitely is, is everything. So certs, LinkedIn, you know, online, the free information that's already provided by the organization. And then going back again, again, utilizing all your tools, everything that you have. I mean, Dan mentions this all the time in his YouTube videos and on his like, you know, uh, small little snippets that he has on LinkedIn and on, um, on his Instagram. I mean, you know, he definitely posts a lot and those are literally golden nuggets. I mean, uh, for somebody that has no background experience in clinical research, you could literally go through Dan's entire history and be more than ready, <laughs> you know? Um, so, yeah, it's just crucial for you to really step back and think about where it is that you'd like to go and how you're going to get there. And different things like, for instance, what I just uh, stated right now, uh, how that can how you can use that to help you maneuver and mold yourself to get the specific position you want. But that's it for that topic. Um, is there any questions in regards to that? Would you suggest to apply to CRO websites directly after research or go with job boards? Um, well, something that I tell my clientele is um, you want to use all tools, right? And, um, you know, obviously it can't give this much because we're already on a specific time frame but um you know the job boards i use everything uh really what it comes down to is your application process right creating the perfect resume the perfect linkedin profile and um also having you know good cover letter and reference letter all that stuff like all that is super important because at that point you already have your LinkedIn prepped and prepared and nowadays with everything being virtually you can go on Indeed and you can go on Glassdoor and you can transfer it from LinkedIn and it's perfect because LinkedIn is the perfect area not just for your valuable information like the very crucial information but it's also a perfect area for what I call as fluff like it's just the extra that makes you look extra that a lot of people don't go out of their way to use um, which is important I mean I've been told great things about it on my interviews, the multiples of ones that I've had before. So um, yeah, I mean, I, I think using both, um, I would suggest that if you are, you know, really in the urge to get a job right away and not be picky about, you know, what particular it is that you want, um, definitely, you know, it's very possible to be shooting out 10 to 20 applications a day once you have that foundation situated already you know it, it takes a bit of time i mean uh, with my clientele i'll have a one hour call with them and i'll give them a whole week for them to work on that because the edits are typically a lot of edits and then i do a second review of the edits and then at that point we create you know the page the profile and then once that's done you know go through the whole process right it takes it takes a while this is not just something that you just kind of do this or that you know a lot of people do it like that and that's completely fine but again you won't be utilizing the ai ai algorithm the way it's formulated to be used to your benefit and um you know 
keywords, key markers, and things like that, you won't be utilizing that. So you'd be like five steps behind, kind of still be good, but you know, uh, there's just a lot to it. And uh, if you know how to use it and do it right, you'd find interviews right away. I mean, like I said, you know, go to my reviews and most of my uh, clients, I would say about 85% to, to 90 uh, within the week got interviews um, because that's just, you know, if you take the time to do that um, and be very methodical on how you're doing it, because uh, it's not just a template, it's it's really thinking about what you come in with, what your strengths are and how you display it. But hopefully that answers your question. And while we're waiting, you guys, I really do hope that um, you're taking uh, as much notes as possible or that you come back and review this because this is really key. I mean, it's not nearly as long as the other ones that I've done. Um, but what I'm covering right now, really, if you if you really sit in on it, it's 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 such crucial information. Um, I personally wish I would have been more intuitive, more in depth with what I know now back then, of course, but um, all of these things really can change, you know, how quick you get jobs, opportunities, but also, you know, this is stuff that you can utilize as you're moving forward in your career. And it could also assist you in, um, you know, uh, it could also assist you when it comes to raises and getting you uh, uh, job promotions and things like that. I mean, this is, it's crucial. It's, it's really good information. On um, how can one be a client and cost to be one? Okay. Um, so for um, one, you would, I would always say, go to my LinkedIn first, look at my reviews, uh, feel comfortable first. Right. Um, I would, that's what I would do. I would never, you know, go straight into with anybody's clientele. Um, but so what I do uh, is a two hour session one hour that we get on a phone call and I zoom and you send me all your documentations and we go through it. I show you my, my reasoning behind everything, how I'm viewing it, why we're going to adjust. Cause I have not came across a client where I don't completely just change the resume. Um, and I explain, you know, why we're doing the things we're doing. I give you specific pointers on things you should focus in on and add in the meantime, that whole entire week, um, things that you could do to strengthen your resume. And we even, as I'm going through it, I even kind of give you some hints as to how you would bring it up in an interview and why and how you would word it within the interview. Um, more particularly, we go over your reference listing. A lot of people don't have that, which you should. Um, uh, we go in depth with the cover letter. A lot of people, I mean, and I'm talking about people that have had, that have worked with, that had one had, I think, what, 15 years experience. And the cover letter was just not great. You know, I have not yet came across across a good cover letter. So um, I've definitely seen the, the issue uh, with a lot of people and where the roadblocks is, regardless whether they have experience or not. So um, I feel very confident. And especially because of how many clients have already gotten jobs and how quick they've received the jobs after utilizing my what I provide. So um, we do two hours. It's done within a week span. Go over LinkedIn. And after that, you know, most of them go to the mock trial interview. Also another two hour process. Um, but that two hours, which is the main program, is uh, 250 USD for the two hours. Um, again, we're on the Zoom call. I'm also on the phone with you and we're going over the edits and you also can use Google email between that week. You can send me your edits and we're going back and forth and just reviewing everything. It is a kind of intense process for some people, depending on how, how not prepared their, their application process is. But hopefully that answers your question. Um, another one is, uh, if I may ask, please, how do you know what aspect you want to specialize on? Is it based on your passion or based on where you get your first job experience, et cetera, trials in oncology or autism or another field? Well, for me, for example, um, I did like clinical research, but as I said, my background was in uh, the clinical industry. I initially wanted to be a doctor. And during that time, that time frame while I was in college, I did about 458 hours of shadowing uh, doctors in the ER, cardiology, uh, surgical oncology, gastroenterology, and all of that stuff. Um, I realized how much I enjoyed what I was seeing, but I definitely realized I did not want to be a doctor. <laughs> um, and uh, I 
just came to a point where I realized I loved the medicine aspect. I loved the innovation aspect. I really enjoyed um, that patient interaction and all the processes behind it. I didn't necessarily, you know, like the kind of burden the doctors held, you know, because I just, I didn't personally didn't enjoy it. Um, but the way I want to go into uh, neuroscience, hopefully biotech AI in the future. So, um, and that's something actually we're going to get to in a bit. Um, but uh, I did that because I went into neurosurgery uh, shadowing and I actually got to see, you know, the spinal cord and everything and electrodes and stuff. And uh, there was actually uh, a specialist there from a sponsor um, who was uh utilizing some new technology, GPS technology on a patient that was going through a full spinal cord realignment. And it was amazing. Uh, normally that procedure would take seven hours and they cut it down to three uh, just because they were able to use GPS signaling, signaling with MRI track. It was MRI tracking. It was amazing. And I've never forgotten that ever. And um, that's kind of where I feel the future is going. And that's kind of what I became passionate about. But really, it just, again, it, it comes down to what are your side interests? I've always thought the neuros, uh, neuroscience uh, side of things, because I took classes in school, um, was very interesting. So if you like oncology uh, if, or, or if you don't even know what you like, all the more reason for you to go into uh, edx.com, Coursera, take these small classes, understand, learn as you're going, you know, we're in the era of information, you know, we have so many things at the tip of our hands, utilize all those tools and skill sets that are available to you. So if you don't know, definitely do that. I highly suggest it. Volunteer on your side time or, you know, look up those organizations, oncology, neuroscience, uh, infectious disease. They have major organizations. You can go to their websites. You can read up on some new information. I mean, literally it's, you know, the world is your oyster. You just need to crack it open, right? So hopefully that helps. Oh, so what? can you please re repeat the website I need to look into? Um, so there's edx.com and the other one is Coursera. Now I would highly, more highly suggest Coursera. Um, and there's another one, oh, what is it called? Edvera? No, I think that's a medicine, sorry. Um, I forgot the name of that other one, but really Coursera, I think, is the best one. Um, EDX is more uh, an area where, you know, these really um, Ivy League schools come and offer free courses. Um, it's kind of like it's just a regular class you show up, um, and I think you have to pay 50 bucks if you want the actual certification. Uh, Coursera is a little bit different, but um, Dan has also mentioned it on his uh uh, videos and I even think he's even maybe posted up it a few times. Um, if you were interested in oncology, you can ask him. He actually took a uh, oncology course during COVID nineteen when we were talking. We we're talking. I took data management. He took oncology, um, and he even had his teacher for that oncology course come on and, and do a, an episode with him. So if that interests you, look that up. But okay, you guys. Uh, if you do have one more question. Uh, I will get to it. Let me just go to this last section. Uh, Coursera, let me type that out for you. Coursera.com, I believe. Oops, wrong keyboard. Coursera.com. I believe that's how you spell it, but if not, just Google it. It should come up. If not, you can reach out to Dan. Um, I haven't used it in months, uh, so if I didn't spell that, I do apologize. <laughs> um, okay, let's keep moving. Um, all right. Oops, get out of that. All right. So preparing for the interview process. So this um, is also something I, this is just a very small portion of what I do cover in the mock interview trial and some a little bit um, over the basic program that I, that I provide, but package I provide, excuse me. But uh, this is super important, All right. So uh, typically, when you are getting an interview, if you're doing a site, you'll normally get called by, you know, the office manager or the HR 
departments. Um, but if you're going with the CRO, typically now what happens, especially if it's a big CRO or a big sponsor, you're going to be going through a screening call by a recruiter. So uh, once that happens, the recruiter, if they like you or if you match well, um, they will transfer you over to the actual uh, CRO, sponsor, talent acquisition specialist. Now, uh, after you go through that interview, you will eventually make it over to the hiring manager who will be the last interviewee. Now, something that you need to know is that each of these interviewers uh, or screeners, however you want to call them, um, they all have a different objective. So, you know, again, like I said earlier, a lot of a lot of people, the way they go about interviews is extremely wrong. You know, they just get asked questions and they answer just question, answer, question, answer. You know, it it has to be much more than that. It really does. You know, we're, we're human interaction and now more so than ever, because everything is virtual and, um, you know, we're most of us don't have a lot of one on one contact anymore. So coming off and hearing personality, you know, is always very nice. So um, you definitely want to make sure that when you are preparing for a screening or an interview, be aware of what process level you're in through that interview and try to figure out what kind of objective they're going to be looking for. Um, and again, you know, I could go into literally a whole hour conversation just on that, um, which I cannot do here. Um, but, you know, if you're interested, you can always reach out to me. But that is extremely crucial. Don't just, you know, prep an hour, two hours before the interview or just the night before. Have a plan. You know, no plan is a plan to fail. Right. So, you know, kind of sit down, get an understanding of your resume. And again, this is a process I go through through my kind of clientele. We're not just fixing your resume and fixing your cover letter. You are creating a storyline. You are making sure it is cohesive with your cover letter, but not repetitive. And your personality is flowing through each one. Right. And um, you're constantly providing more and more information that wasn't already provided in the previous. And this is this is very important because, you know, when you get to that final point where you're on the phone with them at that point, you know, if you're on the phone, you're, you're they're sold on you. You have to now be eloquent and and showcase that. So, you know, it's like I say, I can go walk across the moon for you and like help you create this amazing profile but if you're not showcasing that you know vocally or virtually however it is that you have the call you know then that's the next step you have to take you have to have you know consulting or somebody review you on that and that's also partially why I also started to do the mock trial interviews because I started seeing that people have difficulty in that as well because you get nervous and you just want to answer the question and you're so fixated on answering the question right that you forget that you know, you're sounding just like probably the last five people and you're not leaving a mark with the person. So that's super, super important. So please, you know, keep that in mind. If you are not, you know, for whatever reason, can't do clientele with me perfectly fine, but keep these things in mind, review your documentation, create a plan, think really hard about how you're going to sell yourself through your storyline. Cause that's really what all this is, is a, um, a personal and, uh, professional storyline. Be very clear with it and and know your answers and how you will eloquate it. <clears throat> Sorry, not eloquate. Uh, how you will talk about it in a more fluid manner, right? Because that's really, really what it is. When you're fluid, you cannot, you can see confidence, you can see calmness, you know, you see personality. You, you, sometimes the person even comes off fun, very relaxed, and most people do not have those those specific traits while in an interview. So, you know, you want to make sure you have that. So, but um, let's see what continue. Oops, sorry. All right. So, like I said, be analytical and strategic with the way you answer your questions. Um, this also over time, like as you're going through the interviews, right? Towards the end, the way you play this interview out can ultimately even play to a way that you can utilize your skill set if you showcase it right, of course, and you came on very strong and in a really good manner. Um, 
it could actually be something that you can utilize to negotiate your pay. Now, most people are very, very excited about getting into the clinical research industry and they're very, you know, I just, you know, I just want the job. And yes, of course, you know, you want your foot in the door. But again, you know, with my clientele, as we go through everything, I make sure they know their worth. I make sure I let them know where their strengths are, where their weaknesses are. Uh, you know, I, I had one clientele who had an amazing background, you know, and she, she just, you know, she didn't want to negotiate. And I was very clear with her. You need to. You have an extremely strong background. You know what you're talking about. You know what you're doing. You should ask for this or you should ask for that. You know, you need to know your work. So, again, this is something that you need when you sit down and you have your foundation prepped. Be clear about, okay, what would I like to get paid? And so you have these things in mind when you are applying for these jobs. And as you are going through the interview process, based off how you feel your strengths are going with the interview process, and if they're happy with you and it feels very comfortable, then if you feel confident enough, obviously, you know, once once they send over, right, we want to be positive, right? Uh, once they send over your official offer letter, at that point, even if they have a second person, could to be considered by all they they have to wait for you to respond so if you say okay well thank you for the offer letter but i would like to get paid this much and you know explain your reasoning as to why you feel or why you know that you're worth more and they'll come back with a counter right now if they say no completely fine at that point it's in your court and you can say okay well i'll take it or i won't take it um but at least you knew that you you went that extra step for yourself because if you are willing to go out of your way to pay for a certification. You're gonna come out of that certification with knowledge compared to other people that aren't getting that certification. So, you know, you should know your worth and definitely showcase that when you are, you know, going through the process. And I personally actually believe that when somebody counters um, an offer letter, it shows confidence in their skill set and their worth. And that in itself is a very good, you know, uh, viewpoint for a hiring manager. Um, I have a background in HR and, you know, I was very fortunate to be, you know, trained by a very, very analytical person. And I learned a lot. And that was one of her viewpoints. She says, if somebody knows the worth, you know, you're going to see that right away. And that's going to make you really think about, okay, yes, maybe we don't want to pay that much, but maybe that person really is worth it. You know, they start questioning how much do they really want a good, personnel on their team. You know what I mean? So these are just things to keep in mind. Uh, it doesn't always work out like that, of course, but, you know, it's better safe than sorry, right? You know, at least I think so. So, um, but, uh, let me see. And lastly, definitely know um, very heavy amounts about the company. And when I say heavy amounts, I mean, you know, research the website, understand what their focus is, understand what makes them tick and what made the board of directors or whoever is running that site or CRO or sponsorship, what makes the organization run, what makes them, you know, continuously move forward and see how that background that they provide, are there specific skill sets are they looking for? Do you meet that? You know, are you matching the strengths that they're looking for? You know, different things like that. There's And, and I can go also a whole hour on that one as well. Um, but pretty much, again, molding yourself to what they're making very clear and obvious for what it is that they're looking for. You know, I always have people tell me, I just, you know, I don't understand why I'm not getting hired. I always ask, okay, well, what does the company want? They'll tell me, well, the job description. I'm like, no, outside of the job description, like go to the website. What are they saying? What are they, what kind of people, what culture are they? Do you meet that culture? You know, and I'm not talking racial culture, of course, but I'm talking about the professional culture. Like what kind of people do they want? And so um, if you're not doing that, you need to start doing that most definitely. So do you have any questions on that? So I'll go to the last section. And this is more of um, something I'm going to kind of uh, free talk just because, you know, this is something a bit more 
up there, but uh, creating, you know, the layout for your three to five years, right? So right now, being in the academy, right? So, you know, you took the first step, congratulations, you're going out of your way to make sure that you are situating the first step for your career, which is amazing. So that's very awesome. Definitely though, just because you're beginning doesn't mean that you shouldn't stop and start assessing where you want to be. You know, for me, I I definitely knew like I want to be a CRA, but I also want to be a consultant. I want to eventually go further what I said with neuroscience, uh, biotech AI, you know, so now do I want to do that right now? I would love to do that right now, but I don't have that skill set right now. And with something that in depth, it's going to take some time. So right now, while I am getting the experience with the CRO, I am making sure that I'm everything that I'm doing, I'm picking up bits of information from my CTM, my clinical trial manager, my CRA, the clinical research associate, um, the sites that I'm working with, you know, thinking about the situations that I'm in and how that would make possibly play out in the future if when I'm in that position. You know, you always want to keep the mindset that you will be that person, you will have that position. How can I think and what actions can I do to start creating that person now, even if I don't have the position? So for me, you know, I just started in June, but I already spoke with, you know, my line manager and I already asked, okay, well, I want to know, um, does the organization provide Excel Excel training for data management. You know, can I get the Six Sigma training for, you know, teamwork? It's the highest highest level of teamwork certification you can get uh, within a corporation. Why? Because I eventually want to work for sponsorship that a sponsor that goes heavily deep into that, you know. So I'm already just what four, three months, four months in, and I'm already working towards plans that I know are gonna take a few years. But this is so that it's not stressful. I'm not cramming it in last minute. I'm not also stressing out whether I get the position or not. You know, these are things that I'm doing over time while I'm getting experience to make sure that I make the best molding of myself for that position as possible. And in the time as I'm moving forward, right, I'm also doing, you know, uh, this side job where I'm helping people up as well, you know, and um, I'm getting an understanding of the industry in different sectors and in different ways, you know, so it's never too early to start. And I believe that even if you haven't gotten a job yet, that you should already be looking to advance your application process even if you're not ready to apply to jobs yet, I think it's a good time to already start thinking about what do you want for the future because you are going to be certified and you are going to get in the industry. Um, it's just a matter of time, when and where, right? So um, start having that mindset. Be ready, be prepared because I don't know when COVID's going to end, but COVID definitely was the catalyst to push in clinical research and it's going to be huge. I think these next five to 10 years uh, are going to be massive for clinical research. And you are in the best place, the best time to jump into that. So think really deeply about that. Create a plan, you know, be proactive, you know, take some time once a week to really, you know, think about what it is that you want. And if you don't know what you want, take action to find out, you know, don't just hope that it comes to you. Take action you know, control, or maybe not so much control, but, you know, take reins of your life and, and your career, you know, because you can do anything. I got to where I'm at in six months. You know, I've had clientele that have been trying to get into my position for years. What's the difference? Well, maybe I, I honestly don't know in depth what they did or didn't do, but I know that I took the time, the man hours to sit and create what I felt would make a successful person for this position. And I got it. So, um, and everything I'm doing for my clientele has been pretty much the exact same replication of what happened to me. And so I just, I feel like if you take the time to learn and, you know, to plan, anything is possible. 
So yes, that's uh, pretty much everything. Do you all have questions on that? Sorry, Camille, please. How do we go about the internship? Um, I don't. I didn't. I don't think I said anything about an internship. Are you talking about um, like becoming working with my clientele, or um, I really don't. I'm sorry. I don't know which. Getting some experience. Well, I mean, there's there's multiple there's multiple ways. Um, experience. You can volunteer. You can cold call. You can email. Uh, you know, you can use clinicaltrials.org. Um, what I did is I, I mean, I didn't know too much back then. So I, I actually cold called like a lot to the point where I think I even uh, irritated a few office managers. But, you know, persistence is key. And that's literally what got me in the door. And one doctor went to another doctor and I just needed one doctor. And he got me in to all these other specialists. So, you know, do whatever you need to do, really. Uh, I've I've actually, I've told some people, I mean, man, this might work for you. Um, coming from the clinical industry background, um, a lot of the times when people call, especially for volunteering, they will get they will get sent to either HR or to the office manager, right? Now, sometimes, or most of the times, uh, the CRC, within that site will be, because if you're gonna get volunteering, it's gonna have to be at a local site. So um, the CRC obviously won't be the HR or the office manager for the most part. So a lot of the time what'll happen is you'll get transferred to the office manager. They'll either take a message that might not ever get relayed or you know, the office manager is in, in a busy with whatever what's going on and, they'll forget, you know, that can happen. I've seen it happen. Um, so really what you want to do is go to the website, find out who the clinical research coordinator is or the head of clinical research. If you don't have the name there, call them and ask, get that information, call and say, I would like to speak to that person directly about volunteering for free. I mean, I'm sure if you say that, boom, right away, you know, um, at least I know at the sites that I had previously volunteered and worked for. Um, I know for a fact that they took free work anytime that they could get it. So, so that's possibly one way you could do it. It's just, again, using all the tools in your toolbox, just being innovative and doing your best just to get a hold of as many people as possible. Do you have any website in Canada I can visit for that? Uh, no, cold calls is you're just calling your location. Um, and wherever the sites are in your area, look up those sites. Um, for sure, say your local doctor has a, you know, a research site there, or there they are a public or a private research site. Go to their websites. It'll typically be the clinic's website, and search from there. It's just one by one, really. It's it's that was a very brutal process for me. But back then, I was extreme. Oh, I mean, I still am, but. Back then, I definitely was extremely, extremely uh, persistent, and I really wanted it. So um, I didn't care what I needed to do. I know it took me a few hours, and I think up to two weeks, but I got through. And um, but I know that Dan has videos on this, so you definitely want to reach out to him or or Monica, and they can relate to the right video. But he talks about this about you know getting into volunteer different sites you can use and things like that. So. Um, since he has a lot of clientele uh, or clientele in Canada, I mean, he may be aware of some. You're welcome. Um, are there any common behavioral questions for clinical research interviews specific to the field, not general behavioral questions? Um, no, actually, um, the interview questions that I've received uh, are pretty general when they're comes to behavioral. I think really what they're looking for, you know, I mean, because ultimately, whether it's directed to the industry or not, or if it's general or whatever, the point is the outcome still has to be the same. You still have to show the, not the correct answer, but, you know, your personal response to it and involving an experienced time within the industry. Or if it's not within the industry, you want to provide a, a response in a previous experience you had that can be related to the industry. Now, 
how to go about wording that and how you maneuver, you know, that's a whole lot in itself. Um, but just to kind of give you a surface answer, I think that's the best I think I can do. Um, I mean, I, I hope that that helps. But nothing specific. I mean, uh, a question would be, you know, has there ever been a time where um, you've been in a situation where you had to work with um, some sort of management that was, you know, wrongfully placing excess amount of work on you? How did you feel about that? What did you do uh, to address it? And what was the outcome, right? And something like that, or something basic as tell me the time that you had to really showcase uh, good teamwork under a stressful environment, you know? I mean, those are all very common. I've literally heard those over the years since I was maybe 20. Um, so, and they haven't changed. I mean, even these past months that I did interviews, um, they were pretty, pretty basic to be quite honest. Um, Cause again, you, if your answer is well authenticated, you know, you, all right. Well, thank you so much, you guys. A little bit over, but it's all good. I'm always happy to be here. Again, you know, if you would like to reach out to me, please feel free to go to my LinkedIn, add me, I'm under Ashley Margo. Um, I hope you found some value out of this. Uh, again, if you found this very interesting, please look up the other videos with Dan and Monica. Um, those are the surface of kind of what I cover with my program. If you find it super helpful, if you like it, um, please reach out to me. Um, I know that I can help you. I know I can help pretty much anybody. If not, I'm also still just happy to make a connection on LinkedIn as I post every now and then. But thank you, and I'm so glad you all enjoyed it. You guys have a great weekend and a good night. Bye.